Hi everyone, this is Silmi from Brand Geeks Inc. And with me today is the super chill, super cool, super cat lover, Dr. Farouk Yahya. Uh, we'll do the introductions later, but Sembang Creative is now live. Let's go. Okay, okay. Welcome everybody. Welcome to our third edition of Sembang Creative. And we've got a treat for you guys here because uh, first and foremost, we are broadcasting out of the lovely Malvern. All right, Dr. Farouk, maybe a little bit of introduction uh, about Malvern later on, but just a little bit of uh, uh, context. Uh, it's still a virtual background, unfortunately, but that's a picture of Malvern from Dr. Farouk's balcony. This is super awesome. And uh, welcome, Dr. Farouk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me and inviting me to uh, present some of my work today. Yeah, I, I, um, we've had a few conversations over the last few days and yeah. uh, you just blew my mind. And I think there's no better person for us to have for Semban Creative this time around than yourself. And uh, let's, let's get straight to it. Lah. Um, let me just put this up. I'm hoping people can see because I'm on a virtual background. Uh, but definitely, I think, Dr. Farouk, if you can give us the link to your book later on. Um, the title is Magic and Divination in Malay Illustrated Manuscripts. All right, there you go. I hope you guys can see that. So we're going to dive in. And please educate us all noobs out here. What in heavens does this book uh, tell us about? Uh, so uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. Sure, sure. Okay, great. So you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so uh, so my work is on uh, the art of the Malay manuscripts. Um, uh, especially, my main focus are to do things like magic and divination. But I I'm, I look at other uh, forms of art as well. Uh, so just to just to introduce you, um, what's manuscript? Basically, manuscript is you know before before the advent of printing, everything had to be. Mm -hmm by hand so it's yeah. more, everything you have to like copy by hand if you want a copy of like now if you want a copy of harry potter you can just get a printed copy quite easily but previously if you want a copy of a book you had to like copy the whole thing by hand mm -hmm. either you do it yourself or you hire someone to do it now you so got digital that. copies anyway yeah so that's so what really <laughs> okay cool so, uh, so so you know manuscripts are found all across the world uh you know and they they're made of different types of material. There's papyrus, there's parchment mm. or animal skin, palm leaf, paper, and they're in different formats like uh, codex format, like the modern day book, or you can mm. see like this one's accordion format or scrolls and so on. So many different types of formats. So accordion and, is, the top, is the top, right? It's like the folding thing. So that's why yeah. you call it accordion. All right, cool. Yeah, accordion format or concertina format. And, you know, manuscripts can contain any types of text. You can get like histories or religious mm -hmm. texts or medical texts, letters, you know, whatever. Lah. So, um, and they don't just contain text. They also contain, as you can see, they also contain images and paintings um, and, you know, decoration, uh, illumination. So, so this is what uh, I'm studying, basically the paintings, the art that are found in manuscripts, uh, especially Malay manuscripts. Okay, cool. Sorry uh, to, to digress a little bit, but yeah. thank you for proving that you're still very much Malaysian. Uh, whatever uh. lah is, is warming my heart, <laughs> uh, despite the British accent. Okay, but you mentioned illumination. Could you explain uh, that a little bit? What's the difference? Uh, uh, what, what does that word specifically mean? Um, it, in the in the small in the in the more focus um, form, it means uh, decoration in gold. Uh, that's ah. where it comes from because you know usually these like manuscripts, uh, these ones are, are not really in gold. For example, sometimes you get decoration in gold. That's illumination because uh, right, it right. illuminates the page. Yes, uh, but then, yes, yes. but then at the wider sense, it means also uh, basically decoration doesn't have to be necessarily in gold. But that's uh, the origin of the word. Yeah, that that's the origin, was in, yeah. in some form of uh, metal, gold, silver. Gold, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. But to, in the broader sense, it means basically any like this flowery kind of decoration that's also got right. the, you know, 
nowadays. So, okay, um, okay. So, so this is like general overview of manuscripts. Um, and then, so, so talking about, so my, I punya itu um, study is mainly on Malay manuscripts. So Malay right. manuscript. Um, so Malay language, as you know, is mainly focused on. You no know, Malay Peninsula and uh, yep, yep. Sumatra and Borneo, but then Malay manuscript because Malay is used as lingua franca around Southeast Asia. So mm -hmm. Malay manuscripts not just from this area. You have a like, Malay manuscript from Java, mm -hmm. uh, South uh, Philippines, Sulawesi. So it grows broader. Like, so mm -hmm. uh, Malay manuscripts could come from any part of um, Southeast Asia, really. All right. So as far as your your book is concerned. Uh, which ones were the furthest uh, in any particular manuscript that you could you you included in your in your book that was uh, kind of so, the furthest from from the rest? Uh, my so my book uh, that one is mainly focused on Malay Peninsula, so um, mm -hmm. uh, Peninsula Malaysia, Southern Thailand, Petani, Singapore, Riau, a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I look at a few from uh, Borneo and Sumatra, but my main focus is on Malay Peninsula. Okay, cool. And uh, mainly from uh, around 18 and 19, 18, 19, early 20th century. So basically around um, from the 1700s up to 19, I think that okay. the latest I had was 1933, I think. Uh, the thing That's is, Malay fairly manuscript. recent, isn't it? That's fairly recent. Yeah. 1933 yeah. Is, is less than 100 years ago. Yes. Uh, right. But you don't really find Malay manuscripts or Southeast Asian manuscripts before. Um, from earlier centuries, because because you know they're usually made of paper, so they don't survive yes. the uh, environment, the climate. It mm -hmm. you know they mm -hmm. they so it's very hard to you know understand the, the earlier uh, manuscripts look like. All right, cool. Um, so main so the main Malay manuscripts that survive now are mainly uh, based on the basic Islamic book format. So. They use um, so as you know, they're written in Arabic script known as Jawi, which mm -hmm. is read from right mm -hmm. to left, yep. and they're written on paper, so mainly European paper. And they're how did the they get hold of European paper? It was uh, imported. Ma mainly imported, yeah. So mainly it would be British paper, uh, Dutch paper, right. British and Dutch because of the colonial connections, and then you also have Italian paper. Uh, Italian paper because um, possibly to do with trade with the Middle East because in the Middle yeah, East yeah, also yeah. use Italian paper so okay. that's that's another link uh, so basically mainly European paper either Dutch British or Italian and the untrained eye like me this looks like a copy of the Quran but you're saying that it looks like but it's not it's actually yeah Hikaya Hangtua. yeah this is Hikaya right. Hangtua. so this is in the SOAS collection and and they're usually in the form uh this is called the codex format so like a book like modern day book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but sometimes you have scrolls as well um mm -hmm. uh in different formats sometimes you have the accordion format as well mm -hmm. uh, but mainly in this basically in this book format all right uh so speaking of the quran um so quran are also uh illuminated so they have lots ah, of there you go. yeah That's so the, like the, the golden part isn't it on the right yeah yeah, so this is an Egyptian uh, 14th century Quran in the British Library. It's a very famous Quran, very beautiful gold decoration. Um, yes. And then on the left is a one made in Baghdad in around in, in the year 1000 AD. So, you know, Quran are decorated um, because they're holy books, right? So they, you know, mm -hmm. want to make them beautiful. But they also have a um, function as well. This decoration, they... Um, decoration in the Quran they help to mark the text so usually you find the decoration at the beginning of the Quran uh, and the end of the Quran and sometimes okay. in the, right in the middle of the Quran okay and right. and the decoration has lots of different styles depending on the geographical area and also the time period uh, so I just show you uh, a few examples of Southeast Asian Qurans so um, you have one top left Aceh and then you have Sulawesi, uh, Patani, and Tunganu. Um, so these are the types I, of yeah. I see. I see similarities, yes. but I'm sure there's differences. So, so could you tell us between these four uh, regions, 
Yes. What what is what is it that that is similar or different, and what how do they influence each other? Uh, mainly, so um, so Quran decoration are mainly uh, in substitution mainly on the first few pages, first initial two pages, and the end pages in the middle uh, pages, and they usually uh, the most beautiful ones are usually at the beginning of the mm-hmm. uh, of the Quran, and usually it's a double page as you can see. Um, the Southeast Asian ones tend to be more vegetal. They like the vegetal motifs, you know, the... Ah, that's that's what I saw. It kind of had yeah. the fl- uh, floral or... or yes, uh, yes. Yeah, leafy kind of thing. Yes, going. yeah, yeah. Less <laughs> geometric apart from this mm, mm. one. And the color palette as well usually is red, black, white, uh, gold as well. They're usually these these kind of colors. Right. Um, but, it, but then even within uh, Southeast Asia, there's many different types. So Ache, you would find they like this sort of wings. This Usually there's this arch on the top, bottom and the side. Ache, they, they tend to like this sort of wings, you know, these wings mm. at the side. Very and they like, intricate, eh? Yes. And they also have this like rope, plated rope motif. You mm. might not see very clearly. Uh, Sulawesi, they like this sort of triangle and these sort of circles mm. on top of each mm. other. Mm. Uh, Patani is mainly uh, character- characteristic uh, is the this sort of interlocking wave. You can see it's this wave motif mm. uh, on the left. Whereas uh, Tunganu is mo- mainly continuous line uh, along across the, the, the border and also on the sides, you know, the border of the page. Uh, very intricate uh, motif. Tunganu uses a lot of gold. Uh, mm. Tunganu love gold. Ache mainly black, wa- red, and white, uh, and the others tend to vary a bit. If if I could just uh, jump in a little bit and uh, and ask you because the thing about creativity and design, I mean, we, we work in graphic design, which is nothing related to this at all. But yeah. I'm very curious to see because uh, there's this tendency for things to 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 go in cycles influences they they go through the ages and the generations and and things that people get inspired from from history from from things like this yeah do, do you see uh, in the day-to-day modern designs any of these elements still being quite uh, strong in, in terms of uh, uh, adoption in, in in popular culture um in, in maybe in architecture or things like that uh, in the modern times, I think I know there's some um, some organizations trying to reproduce when it um, like a modern day version of these sort of mm. illuminated Qurans, uh, where they they take inspiration from these uh, earlier material and produce new uh, Qurans, sort of new decoration based on these old ones. So I've seen those. Mm-hmm. Um, not and, quite seen it in popular culture yet, lah. Maybe not. Yes, not, not yet. Yeah. All right. Not not so much. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's the Qurans. Uh, okay. Also, as as I showed you earlier, even secular texts like Hikayat yes. will also have some sort of decoration. We, as well. We've we've heard of Hikayat Hang Tua since we were young. I'm sure yeah. uh, at high school, school and uh, yeah. Skolanda, Skolanda, but we've never seen this version. Is is always the the one with the statue in in museum negara right but but this is yeah. something that we've never seen before how, how yeah. in heavens did you find this uh this is part of the soas collection uh it was uh commissioned by a british officer uh who was stationed ah. in malacca at that time so he you know as i mentioned if you know if you want a copy of the book you have to get someone to copy yes 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 book. so he wanted a copy he got onto as well as other books ah. so this is so he could read jawi yes, that the, yes. this break could read jawi okay yes. shame on <laughs> everybody here that cannot read jawi <laughs> so this um so yeah so and the decoration usually nice, um, nice. yeah yeah so it's a very very beautiful uh piece of decoration um, so Qurans have this illumination but they don't have illustrations they don't have they don't usually have mm. like uh, images. Um, yes, correct. But you find images in other types of religious texts, like devotional manuscript, like Dalai El Khairat. So, um, so I don't know if you're familiar with Dalai El Khairat. It's a, it's a sort of much like compilation of uh, blessings to uh, Nabi Muhammad. So, um, 
lots of blessings to the to the prophet uh, mainly mm -hmm. um it was um it was composed by this gentleman al jazuli from morocco in the 15th century and um so and manuscripts of the dala e lai Harat tend to have images of the three tombs of um uh prophet muhammad abu Bakr, and omar all right uh, this is because in the text, uh, Al Jazuli mentioned, um, you know, uh, Prophet Muhammad was buried next next to next to where Prophet Muhammad was buried was buried Abu Bakr, and next to Abu Bakr was Omar. So that's mm -hmm. how that's why these manuscripts tend to have uh, the images of the three tombs, which are in Mecca. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so they either have illustration of the, these three tombs or they sometimes some manuscripts like this one here from Kashmir they would have um, images of Mecca and Medina so the three mm -hmm. tombs would be part of the depiction of the mosque of the prophet and Medina you can see the three tombs here yep, yep. Um, and then on the right usually it's the right hand side you will have Mecca you can see Kaaba mm -hmm. the black cube mm -hmm. and Medina on the left hand side so these are you know you find this all across Islamic world Morocco India, Turkey, uh, Egypt, and so on. Um, but you also find them in Southeast Asia as well. So this one is from Tunganu, now in Singapore Asian Civilizations Museum. Um, so it's sort of in the format, it's quite similar to the previous ones I showed. So you, it's a double yeah, page yeah. depiction. Uh, right hand page is Mecca and left hand mm -hmm. page is uh, Medina. So, and you can see the three tombs in Medina on the top left. Yeah. Of but the, in of... terms of style, it's very, yeah. very different. Yes. Um, yes. In terms of color palette, in terms of the intricacy, I see this Trungganu one is a lot more detailed yes. compared to the Moroccan one. Yes. So Trungganu, they usually, they like all this very intricate detail, as you say, yes, yes, yes. Um, all these vegetal elements, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it covers basically the whole page, the whole two pages. And as I mentioned, they like gold, that's why they use a lot of gold. So this is mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. gold heavy uh, manuscript. And also the and color palette, yeah. How, how far back, when was this produced? You, could, um, would you be able to find out? Do, do you know? Uh, it would be it doesn't have a date but it would be 19th century so 1800 something uh, right, all right. 18 something but, but this skill has definitely been lost and you imagine it's not that long ago i mean talking yes. about 100 over years but yes you don't see this no more in in, in any of our uh, skill sets culture i mean talking about Malay art artwork uh, in general you can still find yeah. the wayang kulit the batik is yes, yes, strong yes. Yeah. But, but this somehow is not is not uh, uh, has not been maintained. Yeah, mainly because uh, manuscript culture sort of died out early twentieth century. Because once printing got going, mm, then mm. you know you don't need to hand copy anything. You can just print whatever. And but then some printed early printed copies. Some of them have decoration which borrow from yes. the manuscript culture. But the earlier earlier printed ones not. Well, that, that's why I mean that's what I was saying. Uh, where is that continuation? Because uh, uh, from from my understanding of art and culture, that there's always a yeah. uh, re refreshing or rejuvenation of the art form in different technology. Yes. Um, uh, our previous uh, uh, sembangs would talk about things like VR, AR, VR. Why can't these be in that form? I'm just throwing out that question to any of the audience out there. If you're into uh, digital art, why not? Uh, be inspired by this, which is just so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's really amazing. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, the color palette as well, as I mentioned, yes, it's gold. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, like, if, for example, the Kashmiri, you know, yeah, they like pink, uh, but Malay, Southeast Asians don't use pink that much uh, or at all. And they also, this Kashmiri ones, you notice know, got this onion dome, uh, whereas ah. Southeast Asians ones, based on more again the architectural form are based more on local architecture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so much all these sort of structures around the car bar um i'll give you a detail this one the structures in the painting around ah, the okay, okay. Uh, it's based on sort of southeast asian architecture uh this sort of flat roof um mm -hmm. which is got similar to moss roof and also you mm -hmm. know bar 
uh, of masjid tend to have this sort of um, mm. kind of architecture. So this connection between manuscript mm. and also mm. other forms of art. Uh, usually, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get too political, but but uh, uh, what th this is triggering me is that a lot of the mosques, for example, the design uh, are very Arabic, whereas uh, these manuscripts are telling me that there was a strong Malay sense of style in Islamic culture as well. You don't have to borrow from uh, the, the 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 Middle East. You can you actually we actually have our own. It's not just yes. being uh, um, done as much compared to before. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, Southeast Asian architecture, mosque architecture is a very distinct style, its own exactly. style going on for many centuries. So this is very typical. This sort of flat, you know, flat mm -hmm. kind of thing is very typical of Southeast Asian um, architecture. And yeah, and it's reflected in painting. So, you know, people paint what they see. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and just to quickly show you, this is another example of Southeast Asia. It's from South Sulawesi, but it's the opposite. It, I, for some reason, the the artist has decided to swap. So instead of mm. Mecca on the right, it's, it's put uh, Mecca on the left and Medina on the right-hand side. So occasionally, you find this. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, it's sort of mirrored. Um, the the images are mirrored um, again I, I'm, I'm i'm kind of touching on the design style a little bit uh, correct yeah. me if i'm wrong but do i see a, a a hint of a chinese islamic influence here in terms uh, of style is uh, am i am i seeing things that are not there or, or is that something that that uh, you you found as well there's some chinese elements in uh South typically Asia. on the on the right hand side if you it, it uh, looks a little bit like a pagoda kind of Oh, the minaret, yeah, yeah, yes. you know, around Kaaba, around yeah, around Kaaba and um, Prophet mm. Muhammad's mosque in Medina, there's all minarets. So yeah, mm. so the minarets also uh, would be sort of based on. Although I think these might be. Let's have a look. Yeah, so in the Kashmiri example, the minarets look more like uh, straight triangles. Mm. Yeah, in the, yeah. In the Tranganu one. You, might be able to see the triangle, the pyramid with sort of this mini triangles on the side. Uh, whereas in this one, it's sort of curved. This yeah. crest. I'm, I'm, I'm totally digressing. It's just that somebody told me that the um, uh, Sulawesi, the Bugis, uh, the people uh -huh. in Sulawesi, the Bugis, were actually converted by Chinese Muslim missionaries. So, so I'm right. just throwing it out there whether yeah. or not this is a correct theory, but. I saw some Chinese influence. Maybe I'm biased because mm. uh, I was told that theory. But but if this kind of proves it, that'd be really cool. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, I digress. I digress. Right. Let's let's get back to the topic. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of Chinese <laughs> Chinese artistic elements in uh, Southeast Asian art actually, and I I can mm. give you a good example later. Um, right, cool. So so images. So we had images of buildings earlier, but you also find images of spirits mainly in manuscripts of magic. Uh, and divination. So, so this is an example uh, because you know there's a belief that the world is filled not just there's not just the physical world. There's also the spiritual world. So uh, the world the world has all these uh, you know the world has God, but also has yep, angels yep. and the devil and demons and evil spirits. So, uh, so what so are we looking at here? So what here, is this? Uh, this is basically. Uh, like a Raja uh, depiction of uh, to repel evil spirits. Mm. And it seems to be that to repel evil spirits, they would paint, they would draw the evil spirits themselves. Um, oh. So, and then the text just, the text actually says, so this one um, is to avoid for Iblis, Shaitan, or Placid, or Hantu. Mm -hmm. uh, so you sort of gantung pada tempat tidur kanak-kanak. And then apparently, if you draw these depictions, then then they would, you know, the evil spirits would malu memandang rupa uh, in uh, so sort of, okay. I guess sort of like they afraid of see this own, yeah. yeah. Interesting psychology there. Yeah, and um, and in terms of visual depiction, you can see it's sort of they sort of in the front. They're shown in the frontal view, um, and there's no background elements. So it's sort of it's very stylized as well. It's not very naturalistic, which is a very okay. typical 
um, uh, type of uh, visual so, depiction. I mean, I would imagine this, they just kind of made it up. They have. Did they actually see the demon's hands, the, the visual depiction, or is this something they just kind of drew out of, uh, just, just, I don't know, it, something scary would, in their mind? Uh, no, it's uh, these texts, they don't actually, they never mention what the creatures look like or they never mention what they look like. Instead, uh, they would, usually they would based on earlier copies. So manuscripts are basically, mm. they're, they're usually yeah, copies yeah. of other yeah, yeah, yeah. texts. So the previous uh, manuscript this was copied from would have this type of image. So they just copy the image. Uh, and then it just continues uh, over mm -hmm. power period. Over generations, yeah. 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 So, some, so you often find, if you find another manuscript with a similar text, you find a similar type of image within that. And you can actually trace uh, across the centuries or across cultures as well. Um, mm. I haven't researched this one, but you might be able to trace it to other parts of the world, maybe in Middle East or India. Maybe mm. uh, you find similar images. So that's sort of what um, an art historian does. You sort of trace you know, where these images come from. Um, and see what connections are, you know, how did it end up in Southeast Asia and why is it depicted like that? And, you know, what does it mean? Um, so that's what the stuff I work on. Uh, so, all right, cool. Um, and also, you might notice it's not just the, it, the painting, uh, the image, the drawing also has this Arabic text, right? So, text and image goes hand in hand usually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, much um, in Dalek al Khairat, you will have uh, these images uh, basically relate to the text because the text mentions there's three tombs. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have images of three tombs to explain the text. Uh, mm -hmm. In this instance, the the text sort of ex explaining how to use the image, so it's sort of almost mm -hmm. the other way around. And also at the same time, you have a text within the image. Uh, mm -hmm. This one has Ayat Quran in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, this one I from Surah So uh, the ID him sat down and uh, so on. Um, yeah, and it means and we have put before them a barrier and behind them bear and covered them so they do not see. So it's something to do with I can't yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, something to do with vi mm -hmm. vision and seeing. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's something to do with the uh, evil spirits seeing, or you yes, do not yes, see this. Yes. I'm not quite sure about it. So, mm -hmm. uh, you can see this one has wow, so little wows around the head, um, and little Arabic scripts, which I haven't been able to decipher yet. Right, um, right. Sometimes they can be quite difficult to decipher, basically. Um, yeah, so, so okay. that's evil spirits. And you also have animals as well. So uh, a common animal you find in manuscript uh, magic and divination manuscripts is the naga, uh, naga serpent. So um, uh, for example, this one. So the naga is uh, basically a serpent. This is, uh, is this the, on the copy of your book or is that a different one? That's a different one, although it's in oh, the book as well. So, oh, yeah. but yeah, it looks very similar. It's a very typical uh, Malay depiction of the naga. So, naga is uh, basically a, a serpent which uh, lives underground, and it's very connected to water, as you can see, water, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. also rain. Um, and you know, it's found across India and, and Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia as well. It's a very common uh, mythological animal. Um, well, some people argue that it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Um, but uh, but yeah. So it's a very common animal in um, in 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 society, basically. And I noticed uh, that uh, the naga is very similar to the Chinese naga, the Chinese dragon. Not so much the Western European kind of depiction yeah. of dragons. Yeah. Uh, it's quite similar. I'll show you in a bit the, the difference and the similarities, the difference. Um, it's quite similar in a way, uh, but they're two separate creatures, basically. You like two separate species, uh, basically. You're talking uh, as if they're real, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
Well, they are. Well, I, guess, I guess people used to think they're real, I suppose. Um, but, uh, but so in the manuscript, uh, the the Naga is used in many types of uh, divination, so finding out the mm -hmm. future and, um, and stuff. So one method is called the rotating Naga. Mm -hmm. So according to rotating Naga system, um, the Naga rotates every three months of the year uh, along, you know, along the north, west, east, south mm -hmm. cardinal direction. So um, you need to know the location of the Naga during that specific time to do something usually to build a house or mm. go traveling because when you build a house you don't want to end up accidentally you know attack the tiang rumah onto the naga's head uh, why, why not why what's wrong with on the head compared to putting it on the other parts of the body what's the it will bad the luck, luck so, yeah right. it, you know bad luck for the owner of the house people who so, live in so house. you're you're telling me that the malay culture had its own version of feng shui a long time ago yeah and there's many types of this is just one of them there's many types okay. of houses and stuff and also if you're going traveling you have to make sure you don't sort of walk into the naga's mouth you know it's sort yeah, of, yeah. you have to be careful where so that's why you have to know where the location of the Naga is at a specific time. And this is actually found across, this concept is found across, again, uh, India. Wow, that's Shana, everywhere. That's, Asia, that's everywhere. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, but then each region has different variations. So they're not all quite the same. For example, so Malay, um, well, this one's a uh, Malay one. So, uh, sorry. So Malay ones, some of them, in some places, the Naga rotates clockwise. Sometimes they rotate mm, mm, clockwise. Mm, uh, mm. Malay ones tend to be, because Malays are follow the Islamic calendar, so the three months... Counterclockwise, okay. It's counterclockwise, but they also use the Malay uh, calendar for the three months mm. rotation, mm. whereas in, for example, Thailand, uh, they use the Buddhist calendar. So you know, there's many mm, variations mm, to it. Mm, mm, mm. Um, yeah, and also the and it cuts, it cuts religion. I mean, basically, yeah. the culture is is has been there even before the religion was there. I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very very old uh, system, mm. um, and uh, yeah, and again, so so basically, the manuscripts would depict the Naga creature. Uh, for example, this manuscripts from the Raffles collection are probably copied in Penang in eighteen o six. Again, you can see this is a very typical depiction of the Naga. There's no background, uh, there's no frame. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's not naturalistic. Mm -hmm. uh, the Naga is sort of depicted in profile, so towards the side. It's never, mm -hmm. it's never shown frontally. It's always mm -hmm. on the side, um, and you know, there's no legs. It's sort of a curvy body. Um, the tail, tail, tell them like the tail and the kapala is like very elaborate and yes, open yes. mouth, uh, tongue sticking out. You can see the sharp teeth. Um, and around the naga, you can see this text saying, you know, what happens if you much like, approach the naga okay. in specific. Um, so this one says, jika datang dari pusat naga, maha baik padahnya. Um, and then this one, if jika datang dari leher naga banyak luka tetapi tiada uh, tiada mengapa. So you know if Your warfare. Your reading is superb, man. Okay, oh, <laughs> but uh, but this is kind of like a guide, lah. It, it was something yes. that people were sharing uh, yeah. uh, with each other. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, basically. Uh, and uh, so apart from that sort of system, the Naga also appears in another type of system, which is the Rejang calendar. So Rejang calendar mm -hmm. is uh, basically each day of the month has a symbol attached to it, usually animals, but sometimes could be objects as well. So here, uh, for example, the ninth day of the month, Milan Hari Bulan would be the dog, and then 10th day of the month would be the Naga. And then, you know, it depends. Lah. So for example, uh, it says uh, pada sembilan hari bulan is asu or the dog. So that mm. day dijadikan Allah Ta'ala um, so on. Um, so jika berperang tiada baik, uh, banyak mati. Um, 
whereas on the yeah. Asu is a is a is a Bugis word for dog. Yes. So was that more common across the the Malay uh, uh, the different Malays? Yes, yeah, the old it's, it's quite an old word for dog. Um, hmm. Some manuscripts, yeah, like this one, is it still uses the word asu uh, rather mm -hmm. than anjing. Some I think there's other ones use anjing, but yeah, this one uses mm -hmm. asu. So yeah, it's a very very old uh, old word. Uh, whereas this one, uh, but a sepuluh hari bulan uh, pada hari itu uh, diturunkan Allah Nabi uh, Taala Nabi Nuh ke bumi, uh, mm. and then it just says jika bertanam tanaman baik, jika berjalan atau belayar tiada baik. So you know each day Ooh. of the month has specific uh, rules. You know what you can. Yeah, you can yeah, 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 yeah. So the naga is one of the symbol. Is the symbol for the tenth day of the month, and the dog is the ninth day. So I think the first day is kuda, I think, and then you have kijang, harimau, the third day, and so on. Yeah, but just uh, going going back into the art of it, if you, you can yeah. see that it, the style is is again. Um, very intricate and, and you have those different strokes uh, yeah from from the outside to the inside mm. um, yeah this is this is i mean what 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 uh material would they be using to do these illustrations is it like charcoal or something they... uh usually it's ink so, so they, they had ink okay i'm really yeah. i'm really noob about this right so they did have ink at that point yeah. yes uh, and usually they will use the same ink to draw the animals like this mm, one as well as the writing yeah 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 um this one's black and white but sometimes they add red usually the text sometimes uh well this one's the same ink as well but if you notice yeah this one uses red yeah, it has red again sometimes mm. certain words like the beginning of the sentence they would use red to start off to show its beginning mm. of the mm. sentence um okay, okay. All right. All right. um yeah so yeah as i was yeah as you're asking about difference between dragon so um you know that's the indian naga so indian naga looks basically more like a cobra they're based on the cobra yes, yes. many heads so banyak pala usually three usually three five or seven heads um and then you have the Chinese dragon. So Chinese dragon is very long body, has yes. four legs, um, has these sort of feelers and its antlers. Mm. Um, mm. And then you have the European dragon, uh, which usually has wings as well. Um, and looks like this one's got fire coming out of the mm. mouth. So only the European dragons have the fire thing, whereas other dragons, the the, the Asian dragons, wouldn't wouldn't um, have that. I so think so. I can't remember now. I think so. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I, I might check, but anyway. Yeah. But Chinese dragons are also associated with water, if I'm not mistaken. The naga definitely with water. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, you, and and your depiction, the, the depiction of of the Malay naga just now, no is, legs. So it's yeah, more no like a exactly. serpent. You were saying, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There's no legs, uh, but looks less like the. It doesn't look so much like the Indian naga, but looks more like the Chinese dragon. You know, yeah, but without legs. Yeah. yeah, without legs. Uh, this one has, you can see, two legs at the front, though. It's quite mm, unusual. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, but two small legs. You can see the mouth open with tongue sticking out and, the, mm. I don't know, this upper fins or whatever um, along the body, the neck. I mean, talking about, about current cultural uh, usage uh, or depiction of, of these uh, creatures, uh, um, I mean, we know that for, for Chinese culture, it's still very strong. The, the use yeah. of the dragon is still, still very, very mainstream. Uh, yeah. You see it in fashion, you see it in, in, in whatever, in buildings. But for Malay culture, not so much now. Why would you attribute that? Uh, is it because of, of uh, Islam, uh, in a way? Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily Islam. Maybe more like modernization, I guess. All right, uh, all right, all right. Um, even because th this was already, it was still in play, even when Islam yeah. arrived, the people were yes, still yes, using yes. this visualizations yeah. right it's just okay so it's really just modernization but china has modernized but they yes. still uh, uh mm. celebrate their culture we're, we're not doing it as much yeah it doesn't seem to be as much yeah the naga seems to be forgotten but i mean i have found like um reports of even 1950s 1960s of you know of the naga being used for like weddings uh and so mm. on you know because it's sort of a, 
um, a water um, type of animal. So yeah, maybe mm -hmm. not in the last. 50 years years or so. Yeah, fifty mm. years. Yeah. All right. Cool. cool, uh, cool but cool. but you actually no, you do find the naga still in Wayang Um Yeah, 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 so, yeah. Uh, and yeah, this is an example. Uh, again, the iconog iconography or the visual depiction of the naga is very similar to the manuscripts. Uh, no legs. You can see the mouth open, mm -hmm. tongue coming out, and the sort of mm -hmm. crest behind the head. It's very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, the art. You know, across media, uh, you find similar uh, depictions mm -hmm. across the media. Um, yeah, so, and again, um, also this depiction of the Naga you find across all across Southeast Asia as well, very similar. Mm -hmm. You have the Shan, which is uh, in Burma mm -hmm. or Thailand, Thai, Javanese, Bugis, Cham mm -hmm. in Cambodia. You know, it's a very common Southeast Asian uh, connection, uh, regardless. Sorry, of I I'm Bugis, so I'm, I'm yes. going to ask you to drill a little bit more. What does the Bugis Naga, uh, how significant is that? What, 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 what is the uniqueness about the Bugis Naga? Um, this one, I think, would be the similar text as rotating Naga, you know, that every three months mm. rotates. Mm. Uh, ah. I haven't read, I, haven't, I mean, I can't read Bugis, so I'm not sure what this thing says, but probably be the same as... Uh, yes, 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 yes. As the, well, as the I can one. I can get somebody who can read Bugis to oh, yeah, 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 so, so we'll yes. follow up on that later on. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And the charm, I think, would be a similar concept in the Javanese mm. as well. Mm. I think the this three, this four would be the same type of concept. Okay, cool. Uh, cool. Okay. Uh yeah, and this is the cover to book. Yes, so, yes, 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 yes. Sorry, uh, I'm gonna try and put it up again and see if okay. you guys can see it. Nice. All right. So this one why did you pick this for the for your cover? What's this important for this one? It's um it's it's quite as you say, the Chinese elements is quite strong in this one. You can see mm -hmm. uh the feelers and you know the artist has drawn the four legs. Mm -hmm. um, so I like this picture because it sort of uh encapsulates a lot about Southeast, well, uh, Malaysian art. Um, it's it's very mal. It's you know lots of influences from uh, from everywhere. So you have an Indian a Naga creature, which is you know based on Indian and Southeast Asian mythology. Uh, but this depiction depicted like a Chinese dragon, and around it is Malay text written in Arabic script. Mm, and so it with, uh, with all the different paper. influences. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, and so on European okay. paper as well. So you know, it's yeah. very many influences uh, within this just one uh, image in this manuscript. So that's why I thought it very very appropriate to uh, to highlight that. All right. Cool. Um, yeah. So wow, this this is a lot of stuff to absorb. So so yes. uh, What else do you have for us? Um, so yeah, just to basically to show the connection, how it looks like Chinese dragon, and just yeah. just to finish off, uh, just one type of text or image I want to show you is something called calligram. So calligram mm. is basically text which is shaped like an image. Uh, you know this thing like a cat because it's advertising cat food, um, but in in Islamic, so that world. was a modern thing. That was yes, a modern example. Modern. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. This uh, is the the historical example. Yes. So one common one you find in the Islamic world something called the Lion of Ali. So you know Ali was he's a very brave warrior, the Prophet Muhammad's cousin, son-in-law. Yep, so he's yep, known as yep. the Lion of God. So you often find calligrams of the lion um, called the Lion of Ali. Mm, uh, mm, usually mm. the text is sort of like you know. Uh, praising Ali in some form. Uh, you find it across, you know, like Iran, uh, Mid uh, Central Asia, Turkey, mm -hmm. yeah, and so on, Pakistan. Um, and you also find in Southeast Asia as well, these are two uh, sort of Malay versions. Kla the old Klantan flag is in a similar, it's also in the form of calligram. Of I have never seen that. I mean, uh, I, I think it, you mentioned to me that your mom's from Klantan, right? So yes. did, did you see this at any point in your childhood? Was this, uh, no, this is quite in old. Her childhood? No, this is uh, very old. It's, it's only between, it was at the flag between 1910 and 1922 uh, before they changed it. Yeah, and, it's a shame that they haven't kind of stuck to this because this is super iconic. It's, it's very yeah, different it's from what you see nowadays. Yeah. Well, and, do, and, what was the text inside? 
So the text would be uh, Ayat Quran, um, mm. Surah uh, 61, uh, 13, Nasrum wa Karim wa Mu'minin. So help from God and speed the victory. Mm, 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 this is very common uh, text you use, basically you're invoking God for help. And actually in the bot below this, you can see this strip. It's actually a very common thing you find in Wayang Kulit. Uh, this strip of um, it's, a, it's like a platform, right? A vehicle yeah, that, yes, that, yes, that the, yes. the, the the character will always go on. Yeah, yes, and also you find also in mosque as well. Uh, this one's from Tringanu, double mirrored image. Um, mm. So this one, the Arabic text is going the right sort of that way, whereas this one on the right hand side, the Arabic text is going the opposite way. Again, um, this is this is lost. This I have hardly seen anything like this at all. Is there is there any particular uh, uh, cultural or, or maybe strict religious strict relig religious reason why uh, this this use of of uh, calligrams is no longer in play? Um, I think it's you find some calligrams recently. I don't know. You might come across different types of calligrams. I think one common one is one. A person, a man praying, uh, in the mm. form of calligrams. So you find that this sort of uh, uh, the animal shape ones not so much nowadays. Mm. Uh, you, find it, you do find little, a few here and there. Uh, these sort of calligrams. I mean, if, if there's an issue with with uh, animals or humans, yeah. um, you can still use plants, right? To to, to yes, yes, to, yes, to, yes. To, to use the. I mean, again, is is about. Uh, um, manipulating the text to make it yeah. to something more visual. Yes. So again, I, I, it's uh, such a shame that, that this is not being picked up, uh, not continued over the years. Mm. Yeah, I, I've, I've come across some people doing it, but it's not it's not very mainstream uh, anymore. Uh, yeah, so this is another example. This is actually, this calligram is used as a talisman um, mm -hmm. to protect against misfortune, uh, mm. no luck mala and that kind of stuff. Mm. So again, it's made of the same text. Mm. Uh, yeah, and just to end, uh, it's actually also common in uh, Chiribon in Java, uh, where they call it Macha and Ali, so Tiger of Ali, because, mm. you know, in Southeast Asia, it's mainly tigers, you don't really get lions. Mm. But over there, this sort of image is still very popular. Uh, it's a very sort of uh, iconic image for Chiribon. Uh, in fact, you find it on T-shirts. Um, you know, it's something which they is really uh, celebrated over there. Um, yeah, exactly. This is what I was, I was talking about. I mean, I, exactly what I had in my mind. I mean, yeah, uh, we we have all these uh, cultural appropriations uh, in terms of uh, um, what do you call it, uh, popular art and, and, and yeah. all these brands. But but unfortunately, for for Malay. Uh, art like this that, that goes back and has a religious uh, undertone. Uh, may, yeah. Maybe there's a worry that people don't want to uh, get caught by Jakim or something like that. <laughs> I don't know, but but it's, it, you don't see this uh, at all, uh, which is yeah. which is a real shame. Yes. Uh, okay, I think. Okay, let let's see whether we have any questions. Uh, um, I'm I'm uh, I'm fairly convinced that our audience uh, has learned a lot from your sharing. Okay. So, uh, Safti has uh, uh, written in. Thank you for your sharing, Dr. Farouk. I have a question. What is uh -huh. the motivation that drives you to dive deeply in this research field? And what is the consideration to choose Southeast Asia as the objective of your art research? Okay. I I'm going to precursor your answer by telling mm -hmm. everybody that Dr. Farouk is actually a, a, an accountant graduate from LSE. So, yes, tell us your journey from being an accountant to to, uh, to this field, an expert in the Malay art and, and divinity. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, well, initially, what sparked my interest was I did a master's uh, history of art program at uh, well, after I worked as an accountant, I decided to take a year out and I decided to enroll at SOAS, uh, University of London, in the History of Art program, uh, where I did, uh, uh, I specialized in Islamic art, uh, which was very interesting, which got me interested. Uh, and I one of the courses I did was on manuscript painting of Islamic world, um, looking at mainly Arab and Persian painting. And that got me curious about, you know, what about Southeast Asian manuscript painting? And I realized when I was deciding to do my PhD, you know, it hasn't been researched very much. Mm -hmm. um, 
so so that's why I decided to you know when I was looking around um, for a suitable topic, I realized man Malay manuscript painting has been researched very much, especially those to do with sort of magical and divination, the naga. I yeah, I remember going through all these manuscripts and keep finding these naga depictions everywhere and also this image of spirits and I realized you know no one's really talked about them so I thought you know maybe this is something which uh, I like to research more and sort of put across you know sort of promote a bit mm -hmm. um, make more people aware of it so that's yeah. that's my main uh, motivation really and that's why I chose Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia I find you know there's still a lot more to research and a lot more um, to highlight to basically the not just within Southeast Asia, but also the rest of the world as well. Um, it's, it's such a rich culture that I yes, think it, yes. is, is, has, hasn't been highlighted enough uh, no. uh, to have like a global influence uh, yeah. compared to, to Chinese or European. Or yeah, Indian. yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, do we do we have any, any more uh, coming in, uh, guys, from the backstage? Oh, okay. No. So how could illuminated? All right, is it coming out now? Okay, Manisa, how could illuminated manuscript art be made interesting for the younger generation? I'm, I've I've been kind of hinting on that. How do we continue this legacy? How do we take it and make it cool, make it happening without getting into trouble with authorities and things like that? <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Doctor? Um, I don't know. I guess yeah. I guess one thing would be well, if you can incorporate it within the uh. Well, I guess obvious one obvious method would be to incorporate it within the school curriculum, especially the art mm. subject, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead uh, of just lukis pemandangan, uh, yes, you know, yes. you can do like a depict or something from culture, from mythology. Yes. Um, yeah, the the, the 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 argument always is that uh, in in Malaysia at least uh, that there is this strong. Um, movement to to kind of have a strict interpretation of religion which which i'm not really going to go into right now but yeah uh yeah school curriculum definitely important uh yeah. maybe, maybe i want to add in as well uh maybe creating some popular culture merchandising or characters or, or uh, a comic series like like your agent ali open Ipin kind of thing you have uh, pixar did raya right that was supposed to be yes. southeast asia but yeah. it was done by mat saleh so end up uh, a lot of things were not quite accurate uh, compared to to what what Southeast Asians thought was was a, a real depiction of of our culture, yeah, so maybe maybe that could be something that people pick up. Yeah, and also uh, that's one avenue. So another thought, another thing would be I don't know maybe uh, you can produce merchandise. You know this illuminated, mm -hmm. this vegetal motifs. You know they're very beautiful. This gold vegetal motifs. Whether you can produce merchandise, I know in the UK, you know you find like wrapping paper or textiles you know they reproduce mm -hmm. all these beautiful wallpaper wrapping paper mm -hmm. uh they reproduce all soft old toys motifs. sorry soft toys soft toys too yes that's another one yeah. <laughs> i can't help but see the snoopy behind you that's why oh, i yes, mentioned yes. it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so something like merchandising it uh would be quite good um yeah. Ah, Manisa uh, came in again. Okay. I'm interested to see your work being applied to brand building. Wow, I need a muscle realm of marketing. Ni. We're supposed okay. to be semi creative, eh? but it's okay. What are your thoughts on this and what are your plans with furthering your research? Okay. Maybe, maybe uh you want to break down this question. There are a few parts to it. Let's talk about the brand building first. Do you see any link in terms of whether whether any brand can take these uh, elements of, of your research and and incorporate into into uh, what they want to offer their customers. Um, well, I guess I mean you you would know more about it than me, but I guess you know I guess it depends on what the these companies how it fits with their brand, right? I don't know. I mean, it depends on where it fits with the brand and the vision of the company. But yeah, I mean, you know, if they're interested, you know, that's something they can. Um, uh they can pursue and you know bring up further um maybe maybe i'll just jump in a little bit uh, if you don't mind uh, dr farouk uh -huh. um what because what i see uh, the europeans do very well uh, particularly disney which has kind of hijacked all the uh, fairy tales and the folklore which is mm -hmm. which is uh, in a way uh, already copyright free your right. Snow Wise and, and your Hans Christian Andersen and, and those kind of little mermaid kind of stories. So so if indeed your your work can manifest and can share all the mythological stories 
mm-hmm. right, from the dragon and the tiger and and, and uh-huh. all these stories. Then and right. this is where a brand can build it, build up uh, a value proposition, whether in the form of storytelling or or characterization. I mean, this is just yeah. my two cents, lah. In, yeah. in that sense, uh, there is that opportunity there. And, and yes. any brands out there, if you guys wanna wanna go into this, I think uh, you know who to talk to, lah. All right, okay. Dr. Farouk, who's uh, who's in London most of the time, but in Malvern as well some of the time. Okay, yeah. why don't you answer the second part? Uh, what are your plans for furthering research? So basically, I'm looking at other, um, well, I'm deepening my uh, research on other types of um, manuscript art. Um, I'm working, you know, like specific um, other areas to do with uh, Malay manuscript art. So, for example, I'm working on something to do with the uh, seven sleepers of Ephesus, so Ashab al Kafi, you know, the ah, seven yes, uh, yes. man and the dog who fell asleep in the cave and woke up many centuries later. So, that's one aspect which I'm working on at the moment. Um, yeah, Where and do you start with that. Where do you start with that? Uh, quite a lot of the manuscripts and uh, Quite a few of the manuscripts mention it uh, okay. because they usually use as talismans as well, mm. uh, and also things like diagrams. One another thing which I want to look at more are diagrams. Um, mm. I've I've looked at a few, but there's other types of diagrams. Sometimes you have things like circular diagrams, mm. uh, gen, uh, tree, you know, gene, genealogical trees. Um, and there's many types of diagrams you should find in these manuscripts which haven't been researched uh, very much. Um, and so objects as well, like shirts, uh, talismanic shirts, because mm. uh, you find... I've heard uh, my grandfather used to talk about Baju Besi Bagida Ali. Is that oh, something okay. you've come across? Uh, not that one, but there's lots of these shirts which have magical drawings on them. Yes, yes, uh, yes. yes. So, oh yeah, maybe you can tell me more about this. What no, it was just some sort of a of a jumpy or something like oh, right. to protect okay. yourself, uh, berkat, uh-huh. berkat kekuatan, some baju besi baginda Ali or something yeah. like that. Oh, okay, yeah. oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's one thing I want to find. All right. Uh, um, yeah, safety has come back with another question. Do you think that this field of research is actually something that the young generation should discover more? I yeah, think I think so. Pretty straightforward question, isn't it? Yes, yes, I think so. I think it's very important to know um you know the history history of art you know it's because it's part of malaysian culture basically uh, but not just malaysia art. nusantara because we got a few well. from indonesia as well today yeah so safety is actually from from uh bali i believe um, oh, okay. so 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 you because the map you showed just now is, is pretty yeah. much uh, yes. uh the malay archipelago yeah, uh, yeah. patani uh, philippines borneo yes right? yes yes yeah, so yeah, it's very important to know about you know our heritage and you know because it's part of our cultural identity. You know, you have to know yourself uh, in order to move forward, and um, you know, and and also um, once you see, once you re- learn about this, you realize how interconnected we are. So, um, so like the Naga, as I showed, you know, it's found everywhere. So, you know, it's yes, derived. Yes, yes, the concepts yes. derived. The rotating lines derived from India. So how did it travel to Southeast Asia? And how did within Southeast Asia, how did it travel from Thailand to Java and Bugis and so on? You know, mm, how did it travel mm, within mm. Southeast Asia? So that's something which mm. uh, is important to research. You know, so it's all very, it's all interconnected. One of the things I'm researching is how these ideas, these images, been transmitted from one place to another and why it got transmitted as well. Yes, I had that at the back of my mind. I, I just assumed it was trade uh, and because, because uh, Malacca was like the port of, of yeah. the uh, the 1400s and 1500s. Yeah, yeah there's um, trade, but it's also intellectual exchange, knowledge exchange, mm, you know, what kind, mm. how did that happen, where, uh, who was involved as well in this knowledge, transmission of knowledge, basically. Um, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, let's see. Do we have any more before we, we're coming uh, to the end of our time with you, Dr. Farouk? Uh, I, I, I have so many questions, actually, that, that, that you just sparked a, a whole ton of curiosity on my side. And, and what you shared, I, I believe, is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely have one more question coming, apparently, from, from our producers. Um, let's see what, what it is. Uh, they're not letting you go yet, Dr. Farouk. 
Ah, okay. so so you got a really really interesting uh, topic here uh, because this is typically left field from what we normally talk about because uh -huh. we tend to talk about uh, uh, application in, in current marketing right. uh, and branding uh, context. But but uh, what what I found fascinating was that uh, all your research and while it's is obviously anchored in history, but the continuation of it is actually uh, very much an opportunity for anybody who wants to to explore this even more even in modern culture um, yeah. and, and uh, that, that's uh, uh, something we'd be interested to, to maybe follow up with you at some point and see yeah. uh, what have you seen uh, coming up uh, in current form so so natalie is from Semarang, central yeah. java where we have a mystical creature called warak ngendong ngendok Okay, I really don't know how to pronounce this. So, so excuse me if I just butchered that. Warak Ngendok, which represents three different ethnic groups. Javanese, which is the goat. Chinese, the dragon. And Arab, which is the burak. Nah, yeah. that's a mythical creature. People think it's mythical. Eh? Uh, but it's actually in the Quran, right? You notice yeah. a lot of ethnically mixed mythical creatures around Southeast Asia. What is the most distinctive mythical creatures is uh, Southeast Asia for you? Now, let me just give you a double uh, uh, barrel question there. Can we uh, pull up the first one first? um yeah and talk about the warak ngendok yes uh i'm not that familiar with warak ngendok uh, specifically but i know in java there's quite a few of these creatures um uh, i think in chiribon there's the um what's it called uh there's this two uh patsi nagaliman and you know there's sort of mythical comp composite creatures like the elephant mm -hmm. head and the wings and the um and the lion's body and so on yeah it's quite a common southeast asian thing um you also find it in burma as well in burma you also find these mythical composite creatures uh which i talk about in my book actually so you can have a look at my mm. book uh, mm -hmm. and also in malay culture as well the the lion um sometimes it's uh depicted in um composite way sometimes you the lion has wings as well mm. uh, why and create sometimes you have the patient of the lion with wings uh, so again, it's a sort of a form of composite creature um, in there. So yeah, it's a it's a common uh, it's sort of fa fairly maybe not yeah yeah you find it across Southeast Asia. It's sort of composite creatures with different mm -hmm. parts of the uh, of the bodies. What's uh, the second part of the question? Was was there a second part of the question, uh, guys? Uh, what is the most distinctive mythical creature in Southeast Asia for you? Um, I think for me it would be the Naga is what I come across, you know, all basically everywhere. Mm. You know, so it seems to be very um you know, it's very common, you know, in manuscripts, in sculpture, in um textiles, metal work, you know, it's sort mm. of everywhere. Uh it's a very distinctive uh creature in Southeast Asia, I find. Probably okay. I find depictions of it more than most other creatures, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, just from what you were sharing, there were, there were so many versions of it. Um, yeah. And, and you could find it in, in all the different regions. So, yeah. so again, like I said, uh, if, if anybody wants to pick it up, um, um, apparently Disney has done a pretty shoddy job at it. So why not do it ourselves, guys? Okay. Um, I, I um, expecting that no more questions are coming. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Farouk. Uh, uh really pleasure to talk to you today uh you you blown everybody's mind <laughs> we hope that that uh, my questions haven't been too uh, uh too much of a new question but i'm pretty sure some of them were so uh thank you again uh thank you everyone for watching uh please check out turbocharge uh, supercharge lab turbocharge live i'm getting used to that uh 2022 uh coming to you is from the 7th to 8th of october um see you again in the next Semban creative Okay, thank you. Bye.